Okay, this is a work in progress, as you guys know. I'm going to take one second to say hi to you, and then I'm going to be looking at everybody else the rest of the time. So hi to everybody in China. We miss you guys. We love you, and we hope you're doing well. So this week we're going to be talking about um, it's called A Life Approved of God. Um, the first thing I wanted to look at is a verse that's in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. And in this uh, passage, if you want to turn there, you can. It's a, just a one-sentence thing. Fourteen seventeen. Mm -hmm. It's on page one one two four. And here the Bible says. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the, the thing about when we talk about having a life that's approved by God or approved of God, we have to remember that when we talk about the kingdom of God, when we talk about God, we're talking about a spiritual thing. It's not a thing about eating and drinking or a lot of the physical things around us. Although, obviously, that's a very important part of our physical life, especially when we're in a physical form on earth. But the, the kingdom of God is not a matter of that, because that's a very temporary thing in, in terms of God. God is an eternal thing, and, and eating and drinking and the physical things about us, they come, and they're here for a little while, and then they go. So in terms of all, you know, if you look at eternal life or or the history of mankind, our life really is relatively very short, okay? So the kingdom of God is something that transcends all of that. It's about righteousness. It's about peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. These are things that are going to last forever. These are things that were here way before we got here. These are going to be things that are going to be here way after our physical bodies are gone. And if you believe that there's a God and you're going to be in heaven, you believe that this is something that you're going to carry with you forever. It's never going to leave you. You're always go, it's always going to be a part of your reality. So we need to focus our mind and heart on God's love and his purpose for our life. And not just focus on our purpose. A lot of times we can get all wrapped up in just the things of the world. We can think about our jobs. We think about school. We think about our friends. We think about our partying. We think about whatever it is we think about, okay? But they're all short-term, physical, worldly things. And, he's, and here, we have to realize that God has a purpose and a reason for our life that goes beyond all those things. And if we're going to lead a life that's approved of God, we have to be aware of that, that we've got to be looking at spiritual things and not just the physical things. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you want to go there, we're going to read uh, starting in verse 14. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. He says, keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and it only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present to God as yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Then in verse 16 he says, avoid godless chatter. Because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. 
The first point I wanted to make is that it takes effort to be a person approved by God. Okay, he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. This is not just something that is just, we're just going to fall into. Okay, if I, if I want to be right with God, and we've talked about this before at different times, whatever it is that I want to be good at, I've got to apply myself to it in some way. Okay, I mean, if I want to be a good accountant, I've got to, I've got to devote myself to being an accountant. If I want to be a good basketball player, i got to play basketball. I mean, that's all there is to it. I, I'm not going to be good at anything that I don't give myself to. Okay, so with God, we got to realize that when he says do your best to be a, a person who's approved by God, that means that for me to be a person, if, that, if I believe that that's a laudable thing, a good thing, if I believe that God exists, that God is good, and that I want to be a person that God can look at and say, you know what, Ben is my boy. You know, I, I, I'm pro I, Ben is my girl. Yeah. <laughs> Mac is my, is my boy. Ben is my girl. And, and um, if, I'm, if God is going to be able to see that, he's got to be able to look at your life, and he's got to see something that he can be proud of something that reflects what he's all about okay so if he's all about spirituality and he's all about love and kindness and goodness and graciousness and a sense of family and togetherness and closeness and all of these things then that's what he expects from us and as we embrace that if we think that that's a good thing we're going to give ourselves to that and we're going to make an effort to make that happen it's not going to happen just by itself it's going to be, happen because we make a decision that we want it to happen. And that means that I'm going to have to decide in my mind, in my heart, that making quality time, not just any old time, but quality time in my relationship with God, whether it be through prayer or study of scriptures, whatever it is, is going to be important to me. It means I'm going to have to take quality time and give it to my relationships with my brothers and sisters in Christ, other Christians. I'm going to have to spend time with them, okay? Because if I don't, I'm not going to accomplish what I'm trying to be good at. Just like I wouldn't accomplish anything else that I'm trying to be good at if I didn't give myself to that. So you have to think about what's a practical way that I can do that. Again, if I, if, if I want to be a good tennis player, I've got to think about it. What do I need to do to be a good tennis player? I, I need a certain kind of racket. I gotta think about that. I gotta save my money and go buy that racket. I'm gonna need tennis balls. I need to watch somebody or read about it or have a coach. I need somebody to help me to show me how to be a good tennis player. I'm not just gonna walk out there and be an excellent tennis player. It's not gonna happen. It's gonna happen because I devote myself to it, because I give myself to it. And it's the same way with our relationship with God. First, we have to decide, we have to come to know who God is, and we have to decide, is this something that I value? If I don't value it, then I just ignore it. But if I do value it, and I think this is something good, then I give myself to it. So the beginning of living a life approved by God is to understand that it's going to take a certain effort on my part. And I make a decision that this is a worthwhile thing for me. I am willing to make that effort in order to make this happen. The other thing he says here is he says, avoid God, godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Okay, godless chatter is something that is very easy to do. Okay, most of us, all of us, I'm not going to say most of us, all of us engage in godless chatter. I mean, there's not anybody in this room, even the holiest guy I ever met in my whole life, does not just sit around all day long just talking about God. Okay? I mean, nobody does that. I mean, God does that, I guess. I don't know. Someday, I hope I'm in heaven, I'll find out. Maybe he just talks about godly things all the time. And I guess that would be a beautiful thing. But the thing is, I mean, we're here in the world. We're surrounded by things. We talk about all kinds of stuff. So what are, what are the things we talk about? I mean, we talk about our family. We talk about our children if we have them. We talk about our grandchildren. We talk about our friends. We talk about things that are going on at school. 
things that are going on at work. Okay? If you want to know what's important to a person, you know how you can tell? Listen to what they talk about. What they talk about the most is what they love the most. The Bible says, okay, in Matthew 12, 34, and you don't have to go there, but it says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, when your heart is filled up with God, you're going to talk about God. You can't help but talk about God. There is nothing that would ever stop you from talking about God. If God is in your heart. Okay, now, think about it. Think about what you love. And think about, don't you talk about it a lot? Of course you do. It's just natural. My mom has eight kids. She talks about her kids all the time. If you went to my mom and said, look, you know, you're a really nice lady and everything, but, you know, this thing with the kids, this is just getting on my nerves. You know, you really need to stop talking about your kids. You know how long that friendship would last? About two minutes? You know what I mean? She'd say, that's not even possible. You can't, you can't even ask me to stop talking about my kids. It's not possible. My heart is so filled up with my children, and I love them so much, that for you to ask me, to not talk about my children is, is impossible because my heart is so filled with it. That's how it should be with God. It should be with God that there is no way that I am not going to talk about God, no matter what the cost. I remember when I was a young Christian. Um, <clears throat> when you're a young Christian, you don't always do things all that great. Actually, I'm an old Christian. I still don't do things all that great. But... The thing is, there are a lot of mistakes that I made at that time. Maybe I don't make so many of them anymore. Now I make new ones. But, <laughs> but back then I made, you know, kind of rookie mistakes. You know, just saying things that were kind of stupid and insensitive and things like that. So I wasn't always, I didn't always do the best thing, you know, in terms of sharing my faith. I was all excited about my new faith. I was all excited about this new relationship with God. It was filled up my heart. So I talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. And some people were like, Bleh. you know, stop talking about it all the time. And I understood that. But you know what? There's no way I could stop. I could learn to control it. I could show to have wisdom. I could, I could learn how to be more appropriate with this. But I couldn't stop. No more than my mother could stop talking about her children. Now, she knows she can't talk about her children 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Nobody could tolerate that. Even her best friend in the world would say, give it a rest, Gert. You know what I mean? Nobody could handle that. Okay? But they can handle, you can be appropriate with the whole thing. And you can't stop no matter what. And I remember early on, I, I got into a thing, I was visiting my brother, I had been a Christian for a short time, maybe a week or two, uh, a year or two, and I was visiting at his house, and we got into some conversation, and he got angry at me, and we got into an argument, and we've been very close, we're like 16 months apart, and we've been fighting our whole lives, but we stopped fighting as teenagers, and now we're good friends, we're great friends, you know, and we're also in our 50s, so, you know, we grew up a little bit, hopefully, you know, so, but this one time, we got into an argument. So the next day he came over to me and he said, look, I'm sorry about the argument. I'm sorry I got angry, blah, 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 blah. I said, yeah, it's okay. I understand. You know, it's cool. And then he said, I think we're just going to have to make an agreement that we, uh, if we're going to get along, you just, you're just going to have to not talk about God. And I said, no deal. I said, it's not going to happen. It's not even possible. Because, I mean, what, what you're asking me to do is to deny who I am. You're asking me to stop being who I am. I mean, this is a huge part of who I am. I mean, this is, this is my heart and soul. Why don't you just tell me to rip my heart out and hand it to you on a plate? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. It's not even reasonable. You know, would I tell you to stop talking about your son? Would I tell you to stop talking about your wife? You're going to ask me to stop talking about God? It's not reasonable. If you love me, I'm your brother. I'm your friend, you got to deal with this. Whether you agree with it or not, you just got to deal with it because it's part of who I am. It's not everything about me, but it is part of who I am. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the biggest part of who I am. 
is the most important part of who I am. Okay, so out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You're going to know what's important to another person when you listen to them talk. What they talk about, that's what's important to them. So if you're a Christian and you don't find yourself talking about God a whole lot, you want to think about that. You might want to go back and pray a little bit more. You might want to spend, spend some more time in scriptures. You might want to spend more time with your Christian friends. You may want to get more engaged with your faith. Because you're going to need to do that. You're going to need to do that if you're going to grow and mature. Just like if I want to be a good tennis player, i got to hang out with tennis players. If I want to be a theater major, i got to be with theater people. My daughter's an artist. She's a graphic artist. She spends a lot of time with artists. It's just how it is. If this is meaningful to us, and this is something that we love and believe in, then we have to commit our heart to it. And we've got to be willing to commit quality time to it. Not just lip service, quality time. Because we want to be excellent, not just be okay. So if we want to be a man or a woman approved by God, we have to be excellent. We have to give our hearts first to God and then to one another. And we have to spend time with one another. And it starts with God, then to other Christians, and then we need to love our neighbor and the people around us as well. Because God is love, and that's always going to be in the picture of everything that we're doing if we sincerely believe this and we're trying to live it out. Our goal ultimately is to be like Jesus. The Bible says to be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any great, any good work. You know, there's a lot of peace and joy to be found when we cast the sin out of our life and become holy and used by God as his instrument. And that's something that we've got to come to believe in. Because the world tries to tell us that we're going to find great joy in a lot of things that God says is sinful. Now, when you think of sin, sometimes you might think of sin as being like this big black mark against you, you know, that's on your soul. Sin in the Bible just basically means you're missing the mark, which means God has intended for your life to be lived a certain way. And when you're living that way, then you're right on the mark. And you're walking with God in, in, in step with God. When you're not living that way, then you're working out of step with God. And when you're out of step with God, you're missing the mark. That's what sin is. And that causes us to be separated from him. And also separated from the life that he intends for us to live. So the thing about God, if you come to understand God, as, as the Bible talks about him, is that God created us for a reason. He didn't just create us by accident. He didn't just create us for no reason at all. God is a God of love, and love is all about relationships. And the most vital and important part of our life is all about relationships. When we have loving and caring relationships, everything else doesn't really matter. If I have, I can have all the riches of the world, and if I don't have someone I love to share it with, it means very little. And if I'm going through the toughest part of my life, believe me, there's nothing more I need than people in my, love, my life that love me, that I love. Love is always going to be the most important thing. And God created us as that kind of person. We are made in the image and likeness of God, which means that we have been created to be people of love, to people of relationships. God wants us to have this awesome, tremendous, loving deep relationship, first with him and then with one another. That's what he created us to do. And when we have this great relationship, we're going to find ourselves doing a lot of nice things for people. But that those nice things that we're doing are going to grow out of that love that we already have. When you love somebody, it's not hard to do something nice. It's hard to do something nice when you don't give a darn. But when you care and you love somebody, it's not hard. You know that phrase, it's a labor of love? 
What does that phrase mean? It means it's not hard because I love you. When you love somebody, it's not hard to do something kind and good for them because you love them. And that's what God is all about. God has created us as those kinds of beings. It's part of our nature. It's it, it, because it's the nature of God that's within us. Then he prescribes for us. He tells us in his word. He says, look, you want to live this life. This is what it looks like. This is what you should be doing. If you do these kinds of things, you're going to be walking with me and you're going to experience life to the full the way I intended life to be for you. And it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be unbelievable. It's going to be fabulous. Okay? And if you miss the mark and you don't live the life that I've put out there for you, if you, if you don't follow the directions that I give you, where I tell you, you should be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. If you don't trust me, if you don't believe me, and you live a way different than that because the world tells you, oh, no, this is great. You know, this will make you happy. This will, that will make you happy. Just do this and you'll be happy. You know, just go and be successful and get your degree and make lots of money. And then you'll be happy. God's saying, no, you're missing the boat. See, first you need to love me. And then you need to love me and love others the way I show you. And then all those things will be added to you. Then if you get your degree and a good job, blah, 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 things will be great. But what will make them great is what you had right to begin with. Those aren't the things that are going to make think life great for you. That's a lie. That's the world's lie that he puts out on us. And God is warning us and telling us, no, don't believe that. Trust me. God intends for us to have a great life. And we're going to have it when we put that trust in him and we go after it. He says in 2 Timothy 2, starting in 22, he says, flee the evil desires of youth, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct, in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading them to the knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do as well. The Bible here is saying that we have to flee the evil desires of use. We have to understand that godlessness, that when we miss the mark, there's a lot of desires that come, especially when we're young, that that violate what God wants for us. There's a lot of them out there. Now, I'm not saying that you still don't have desires to do things outside of God when you're in your 50s or 60s, because you do. As long as you're here on this earth and as long as you're a human being, there are going to be times that you're going to desire things that go against what God is saying. But particularly, it becomes really enormous when you're young. Why is that? Well, you know, you have a lot more opportunities to do stupid things. You got more time on your hands, you're, you're young, you got lots of energy, you got, you know, you got a lot of people coming at you with a lot of different opportunities and, and ideas and, you know, why not this, why not that, blah, 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 blah. And you have all this stuff. And when you're young, a lot of times you're just eager to experience life. And so you want to experience anything. You're grabbing life, grab life. Oh, I'm going to grab this, I'm going to grab that, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. The thing is, we've got to be careful, though. We've got to be careful what we're grabbing at. Because not everything that's out there to be grabbed is necessarily a good thing. And that's what God is saying. Understand that there are desires that you have that are totally good, great, awesome, godly, fantastic. You know, I used to say to my kids all the time, you know, there are a billion things in this life that you can do that are good, holy, loving, kind, decent, fabulous, fun, interesting, intellectually stimulating, you know, on, 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 and on. You could live 10 lifetimes and never experience all the good things that God has for you in this life. You could never live long enough to experience all of them. So why do you think you have to do the thing that God says don't do? You don't. It's a lie. 
You don't. You, you think that you have to, or you think that you want to, or you think that it's going to bring joy and happiness to you, but it's not. For every, it, it'll bring you, it may bring you temporary joy, but it's like a drug. It brings you temporary joy, but then later on it really messes your body up. Or you get drunk, you tie one on, and you feel good, and you're happy for a few hours, you wake up the next day, and you're sick as a dog, and you feel terrible. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> That's just a short-term physical example. But there are a lot of other things that are not quite that obvious. There are a lot of things that we can go, because we have a desire to do, we can create relationships that we shouldn't have. You know, if I'm a married person, I have an affair, I may think, oh, this is cool, you know, nobody's hurting anybody, nobody knows anything, blah, 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 it's not hurting anybody. No, it is. It is. I'm hurting my relationship with God. I'm hurting my relationship with my wife. I'm hurting my relationship with other people. Okay, I'm hurting that woman that I'm involved with, spiritually, because I'm taking her further away from God. Okay, I'm taking myself further away from God. And there's going to be consequences and repercussions from all of that. And if I would have just trusted in God to begin with, to just love my wife the way I should love her, and commit to her the way I should commit to her, then I wouldn't be doing that to begin with, and all the possible repercussions that could come with that, and all the problems that come with that, are never going to come to fruition. Why? Because God protected me. He was the fortress. He was a spiritual fortress between me and all the garbage and consequences that come from my own sin, my own missing the mark. Now we have problems and troubles in this world that have nothing to do with us, obviously. I mean, if we're driving down the street and some nut comes flying through an intersection and hits us in a car, I mean, it's not our fault. We didn't do anything wrong. You know, if I'm just walking around, I get sick, I get cancer, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's not my fault. I mean, life does have troubles. And, and the Bible says that, too. He says, in this world, in this life, you will have trouble. God's not promising, oh, you become a Christian, you'll never have another problem. And if you hear some preacher tell you that, he's lying. Okay? It's baloney. It's not true. Life does not get totally perfect because there's things completely out of our control that happen. But you know what? Even when those things happen, again, going back to what I was saying, if we have a close, loving relationship with God, and we have the kind of relationship with God and with our brothers and sisters and our family and stuff that God intended... The worst place that we could possibly be in is going to be a lot better. It's going to be the best that it can be. If things are bad in my life, I want all the friends I can get. And I want loving, giving friends. People that are willing to care and love and give themselves to me. Because I'm hurting and I need that. And that's true of every one of us. So God always makes the whole thing better. Okay, and we have to understand that this godliness is not just wrong, it's dangerous. Ungodliness. Ungodliness. Un or godlessness. Godlessness. Ungodliness. Ungodliness or godlessness. Sin is dangerous. And if you don't think it's dangerous, you're fooling yourself. You're being deceived. Okay, you bought into a lie. It's not true. It is dangerous. And it's hurting you. It's hurting you spiritually. And it's hurting you in many ways that you can't see. And the, long, the more you know God, and the more you walk with God, and the longer you do it, the more obvious you're going to see it. It becomes very clear. But sometimes when we just observe it from the outside looking in, we can say, oh, well, that's an interesting idea. But we don't, we don't know that it's true or not. And we say, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And one of the things that I did for years before I became a Christian, I learned just a little bit about the Bible, not a whole lot. And I had friends that were Christians, and I liked all of them. They were really nice people, as Christians tend to be if they're faithful. <laughs> okay? And... and uh, but I didn't want to be one, because I like my life. And I like doing drugs and having sex and doing all the stuff that people do in the world, right? And so I didn't want to give my life to God. I didn't want to go down that road. Now, one thing, though, is I would read things that God said about things. And I would read words 
of Christ or different things, and he would say something about life. And I would say, no, that's not right. You know, I don't agree with that. You know, that, that's his opinion, but, you know, I think this. And I would say that. But then I would kind of observe. And over a period of months and years, I go, you know what? He was right. He was right, and I'm wrong. And then there'd be something else. And I'd go, no, 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 that's wrong. And I would watch. <laughs> I would look and look and go, you know what? He was right. I'm wrong. <laughs> and after doing that about 20 or 30 times, it started getting through my thick head that God was a lot smarter than me. <laughs> that Jesus was a lot smarter than me. <laughs> that he, he knew a lot more about what was good and right than I did. But I was very stubborn to accept it. I didn't want to accept it because I didn't want anybody to be my Lord. I wanted to be my own Lord. I didn't want to accept Jesus in that way. And so I wouldn't. So I just observed from a distance. But finally, over a period of time, I finally get to a point where I said, you know what? What if everything I think that's different from what he says is wrong and what if everything he's saying is exactly right what if he really is the son of god what if he really is who he says he is i mean he's either a liar or he's a lunatic or he's lord he's one of those three and over a period of time i came to the conclusion that well if he is right and i'm wrong then I got a bunch of stuff I need to deal with. And I started making some changes in my life. And that was the beginning of the road to me coming to know God and to following Christ. Is once I accepted, I first had to just accept the possibility that he was right and I was wrong. Because that's where I was at. I was so stubborn. There's no way I was going from where I was to immediately just, oh yeah, Jesus is Lord, I'm all over it. You know, I couldn't get that far that fast. Well, I probably could have, but I, I mean, theoretically I could have, but because of my personality, I couldn't. The problem wasn't God. He would have been willing to do it. The problem was me. But I'm just saying that over a period of time, I realized that God was right. And that this is all about understanding that these evil desires, that these foolish arguments, that the desires of the youth, that, that a lot of these things, they're not just not good, they're actually a danger because it corrupts the good life that God intends for us to have. See, God says, here's the life I want for you, and it's really fantastic. But if you're going to have it, you, you're going to have to trust me, and you're going to have to go with me on this, and then watch what happens. And when I go against it, I corrupt the good that he's established. He created me to have a relationship with me. He created me to be, have a life filled with love and direction. When I obey him and I follow him, I experience that life. When I don't, I corrupt it. And I never really get to see it the way it is. And if, I, and if the way I try to, when something goes wrong in my life, if I don't turn to God to fix it, I turn to myself. And what I end up doing is just try plan B, C, D, E. But B, C, D, E are still all my plans. They're still opposed to God, and they all come to a dead end and still screw me up. So I, I go back to plan A and, and, uh, and listen to what he's saying because it's all good stuff. Again, to be approved by God is a great place to be. And I think we need to stop and think, if I'm not in this place, what is it that's preventing me? from being in this place. What prevents me from experiencing this great life that God has for me? Why don't I have it? Why don't I? What's keeping? And I guarantee you, it's me. It's you. It's not God. God's not wanting you to be. He's not withholding anything from you. He loves you and he wants you there. It's all a question of when I'm not there, it's because of me. It's because of my choices. And I've got to look at the choices I'm making and say, what do I need to change in my life so that I can line up with this? Again, if you believe that it's true. Open your mind, open your heart, let God speak to you, 
And if you believe it's true, then do something about it. But don't just think about it. Don't go into the paralysis of analysis and just examine it and let it run through your head a thousand times, but never do anything about it. Actually do something. And make it the central focus of your life. Make it who you are. And that's the bottom line here. And we need to understand that God is not calling me to some nice philosophy. God is not calling me to some system of beliefs that I carry around with me so I can rattle off a bunch of proverbs and sound wise to my buddies. God is calling me to a life. He's calling me to a life that's filled with a close, loving relationship. First with him, then with one another, and then with all the people around us. It's a life that he wants for us. He doesn't want us to just believe good things. He wants us to live good things. And when we live the good things that he's had out for us, we live it with no regret. And we become the kind of people that the Bible says are approved by God. So, that's my deal. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.